recording. Right. So greetings, my name is Eric Chen and as chair of APA Division 49's Diversity Committee, I would like to welcome you all to this diversity presentation. And this presentation will be about 50 minutes long so that you all will have a short break before your next appointment or meeting. Uh, please note, this presentation is being recorded. The recording and the presentation slides will be made available later through Division 49's uh, YouTube channel, where you could find our previous two diversity presentations recordings as well. And after this presentation, we will have three more diversity presentations before the end of the uh, year. And I'm sending you the, now the link to our divisions, uh, diversity resources in the chat box. And after the, you click the link, you will find more detailed information there and our the division's YouTube channel here. So let me send you the check uh, the link to the chat box now. And then here I would like to say a few words to introduce our speaker, our presenter. And Joe Miles is an associate professor in the Department of uh, Psychology at the University of Tennessee, Nashville. He earned a PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Maryland, College Park in 2010. His research focuses on the processes and outcomes of group interventions, including intergroup dialogue and group psychotherapy, as well as issues related to sexual orientation and the health and well-being of LGBT individuals. He is an associate editor for Group Dynamics, Theory, Research, and Practice, and the International Journal of Group Psychotherapy. Joe's presentation today is titled Using Group to Promote Justice, the Theory, Search, and Practice of Intergroup Dialogue. Joe, take it away. Great, thank you, uh, Eric. I am happy to be doing this presentation. I'm about to share my screen. Um, the last time I did this was in a faculty meeting and I shared, <laughs> I shared all the wrong things uh, in a faculty meeting. So let me uh, make sure I get this. This right here. One participant can share at a time. Advanced sharing options. It's screen share. Here we go. So um, I'll, I'll start by telling you all a little bit about how I got involved in this um, in intergroup dialogue work. Um, does everybody see uh, see my screen now? Great. So um, I initially got involved in intergroup dialogue work when I worked with Dennis Kivligan at the University of Maryland in, in my graduate training. Um, as, as you all know, uh, presumably Dennis Kivligan uh, does a lot of group psychotherapy process and outcome research and group interventions. And he was aware of my interest in um, diversity and social justice issues and thought that this might be a way to bring together my interest in group dynamics and group processes with my interest in, in social justice. So. Um, so when I was at Maryland, I started working with the intergroup dialogue program there called Words of Engagement, uh, facilitating dialogues, uh, which I loved. And also uh, I did my thesis and my dissertation both on the facilitation of intergroup dialogues. Uh, I think I'll mention that a little bit later on when I talk about some research. Uh, since then, I, I did my internship at the University of Illinois Counseling Center in Champaign-Urbana. Uh, I was involved with their intergroup dialogue program there, which actually at the time was run out of the, the counseling center. I'm not sure if it still is or not. Um, and then when I came to Tennessee uh, in 2010, uh, I have been, since I've been at Tennessee, I've been working on developing an intergroup dialogue program here. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that looks like um, as we get a little bit further on. Um, it's been kind of a process. Um, I've had uh, certain certain folks who have been uh, supports and uh, who have come and gone from the university. So it's, it's taken a while to get where we're at, but it, we're going in a good direction. So, um, so let's see. So an overview of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, I'm trying to present everyone with uh, both a little bit about the, the practice of intergroup dialogue and some of the theory that undergirds it, uh, as well as the research that, that I and others do. Um, so it's kind of a lot that, I, that I'm attempting to cover. Um, I'm happy to have ongoing conversations with folks if, if, if I'm not getting exactly the mix of that that, that, um, that you're looking for, but I figured that there are folks that will be more interested in the practice component of this and folks that might be more interested in, in some of the research. Ultimately, um, my conclusion here uh, for this talk is that I think that group psychologists and group psychotherapists um, have a lot to bring to intergroup dialogue work. Um, and I also think that intergroup dialogue work has a lot to offer both group psychologists and group psychotherapists. So hopefully um, we'll end up at that conclusion through my talk today. So first I wanted to talk about why is this necessary? 
um, why talk about intergroup dialogue, why spend time developing this on campus. Um, and I, I'm sure you're all aware of, of a lot of the social and political um, conflicts that we're seeing, the increased um, division that we're seeing. Uh, I found these data uh, on Pew Research's website that show um, surveys of polarization, political polarization um, from 1994 to 2017. Uh, I was hoping I would find something even more recent because I'm imagining that the pattern that we're seeing here in these data um, would continue to um, to spread out uh, in terms of where people are at ideologically. But um, but the point is that we, we're living in a time that there's a lot of division, we're very divided. And we're also living in a time when there are, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, social unrest about um, racist violence, particularly at the hands of um, law enforcement and other institutions. We're seeing negative um, reactions to those protests um, about racial violence. Um, we're, we're in an election that's um, increasingly heated. Um, we're in the midst of a pandemic that's disproportionately harming people of color and, and poor people. Um, and so there's a lot of things going on in our country that suggest we need to be um, taking some time to, to talk with one another, to talk across political and ideological lines um, and to uh, address some of these uh, social and political issues that, that are facing us today. Um, I will say, I guess, I guess one of the caveats that I always put into um, a talk on dialogue is that, um, I say this to my students too, that this, I think that dialogue is a t one tool that we have. I think that it can be really useful um, for certain things. And I'm not saying that it's the thing that we always need to do all the time. I think that there are times when debate is appropriate. I think there are times when something that's less dialogic is appropriate. Um, I think in the type of work that we do, um, you know, even doing dialogue, um, we, we're not saying that it's okay for someone to just say whatever they want um, and to be hurtful and um, uh, oppressive, but, um, but it's cool for, for folks who are uh, willing and able and want to engage with one another across different lines. So what is dialogue? I've used this word a lot, and I'm gonna make a distinction today between dialogue as a form of communication and then intergroup dialogue as a specific uh, model. Um, and I'm gonna focus my talk on higher education because that's, that's where I do my intergroup dialogues. But dialogue as a form of communication uh, is an alternate to um, kind of a conventional discussion or debate um, form of communication. So, so uh, this uh, is yeah. Of, you know that, I don't know if you uh, noticed that your slide remains uh, has, uh, it's yours, it's the first one. Oh, that's weird, because it's moving on mine. <laughs> Let's oh, no, see. it has to move for us. Oh, sorry, thank you for letting me know. Yeah, um, thanks, Eric. It says, it says resume share. Um, you, um, has to do with um, public, what we see is that you all... I'm gonna stop it and start it again and see if it, see if that'll do it. Do you see a slide that says, what is dialogue? Yes. yes. Okay, so that's where I was at. Um, let's see. Do you see that? Yes. A different slide? Okay, so this is, this is what I was showing you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and especially these things that are the, the, the few visuals that I have, I'll, I'll return to this. So these, these are the data from the, uh, the Pew Research Organization that show the, um, the shifts in political ideologies over time. So we can see uh, Republicans and Democrats getting farther and farther apart from one another in terms of their uh, political ideologies. Um, and then I had some slides up of um, Black Lives Matter protests, that, um, some election um, data. This is uh, this is a graphic that shows racial disparities in, in COVID-19. Um, and so so these are the kind of the images I was showing to kind of reinforce the idea that that we're in, in a very divided time and we need to figure out some ways to dialogue with one another. Thank you, Eric, for uh, pointing out that you had not seen any of that. Is it did it advance again? Did it say what is dialogue? Yes, good? Well, I okay. think you are probably uh, showing us the speaker view of your presentation. <laughs> Uh, probably both sides of what you are going to present next. So, huh. yeah. how about that? Oh, now it says it stopped. Yeah. Sorry about this. Um, yes. How's that? Yeah. Great. Okay. 
Oh, what is dialogue? Um, it's, a, it's an alternative to conventional discussion or debate. Um, I think that we're all probably very familiar with what debate looks like. Um, we've been seeing some examples of some uh, unproductive debates over the past couple of weeks. Uh, I think that we're going to be seeing a bunch more of that as we get closer to the election. Um, but in a debate, the idea is that people are trying to win or to convince people that their um, their argument or their position is right. Um, it is the one that, that we should go with. Um, Whereas in dialogue, what we're trying to do is not necessarily come to an agreement. That might happen. But what we're trying to do is to develop some shared understanding of one another. So understanding across, um, across difference, um, developing some shared meaning as we communicate with one another. So note that, that this does not necessitate that we agree with one another. So we can have a dialogue even when we, we strongly disagree with someone. Um, the idea is that we're trying to understand that person from their perspective. Uh, in the process, maybe we will come to share the same perspective, but that's not necessarily the goal of what we're trying to do. Um, oh shoot, is it not, not advancing now? <laughs> Let's try that. There we go. Um, so some of the features of dialogue, what does this look like? Uh, dialogue involves risk and vulnerability. Um, it involves a mutuality or a spirit of, of equality and collaboration. Um, I think just like in group psychotherapy, um, people have to have some buy-in into what, what we're doing. Um, so we spend a lot of time early on in dialogue, and I'll, I'll get to the model that we use, but we spend a lot of time talking about how we're going to talk to each other. Uh, it's very purposeful in terms of having some meta-communication, like how do we want to be with one another, um, and what are, uh, what are ultimately our, our end goals. Uh, and it also involves some commitment. Um, there's a man by the name of David Bohm uh, who, who's done some writing on dialogue. He has a book called On Dialogue. And in that uh, book, he talks about four characteristics of effective dialogue. Um, if you're interested in dialogue as a form of communication, I think his book is really accessible and it's short and it's, um, it, it does a good um, overview of this type of communication. But what he says is that we need to be able to suspend our judgments. Uh, we need to use deep listening. We need to identify our assumptions and we need uh, to use reflective inquiry um, as we're communicating with one another. And I think that, um, you know, the reason that I put these up here is that I think that these are really um, some of the keys to dialogue that I see our students um, work on. I think that these are things that, um, you know, like suspending judgments when we're listening to someone talk, particularly someone who doesn't share our beliefs or values or experience. Um, I, I think that we can notice ourselves starting to judge, make judgments, or having assumptions. And so I think that one of the keys of learning to be uh, effective at dialogue is to note those things are happening um, and to kind of hold them aside so that you're free to continue to listen. Because if we are listening to someone and we have these judgments and we have these assumptions, it's going to prevent us from being able to fully, deeply listen to them. So um, I think that when we talk about ground rules in dialogue, often people say um, things like, uh, don't judge other people. Um, I think that we have a tendency to make judgments. Um, and so I think that what I think is more important is noticing these judgments and suspending them so we can um, dialogue with one another. So um, another author who, um, who's written about dialogue, who, whose work that I find useful when talking about this as a form of communication is um, Deborah Flick. Um, and this, this table here comes from her book called um, From Debate to Dialogue. And she makes the distinctions here between a, a conventional discussion process that we go through in which there's one right answer, that our goal is to persuade or convince people or to win. Um, our attitude is evaluating and critical. Our focus might be something like, what's wrong with this picture? Um, so I think, I think that if we think back, if you've, if you've watched the recent debates, that's probably uh, what the debaters are doing. Um, they're listening, they're listening for flaws. They don't want to accept anything at face value. They're planning their rebuttal. Um, I think this is another skill that if we can learn um, to identify when we're planning a rebuttal, um, we can notice that that means that we're not really listening anymore. Once you're starting to say, this is what I'm going to say next, you're not really listening uh, in the same way. Dialogue, on the other hand, um, the premise is that there's multiple valid answers and perspectives. Um, the goal is to understand others from their point of view. So our attitude then is more curious and open, and we might have a focus of what's new or what's of value or what can I learn. So the behaviors are, um, when we listen, we are listening um, uh, and accepting what, what is um, said by the speaker as true for them. 
uh, at this point, um, trying to suspend our judgments again, uh, asking clarifying questions um, to help deepen our dialogue. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to share with you a little bit more about where's that, about what this this can look like in practice. So, um, so what we might do is is um, get into a mode where we're going to relax, listen deeply, um, with a respectful curiosity, becoming aware of and suspending our judgments. Um, I guess this is a little bit repetitive here, but um, but more specifically, we might say things um, in a dialogue like, "Help me to understand." what you've just said, or tell me more about that. Um, checking for understanding. What I hear you saying is this, uh, potentially listening more than talking, um, using open-ended questions like what or how, and minimizing why questions that might sound more um, uh, aggressive. Um, so it, for those of you who are group therapists um, or just therapists more broadly, you probably recognize these sorts of things as, as kind of micro skills that we might use in therapy. And so, um, so this is kind of part of my argument for why I think that group psychologists and group psychotherapists are particularly well positioned to, uh, to do intergroup dialogue work. Uh, in terms of reflective listening, I think that in, um, in the intergroup dialogue literature, this is really where they say kind of like the magic of dialogue happens. This is one of the things that makes it different from other, other types of communication. Um, uh, the University of Michigan's program, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about because it is kind of like the gold standard of intergroup dialogue programs in the country um, and their models used uh, across the country. Uh, what, what they have said is that it's a form of hypothesis testing. Um, it can bring people to understand things in a different way. Um, it can involve a soft confrontation, if that's appropriate. And some of the examples might be things like, it sounds like you're feeling blank, or it sounds like you don't agree with this, um, or it sounds like you're a bit uncomfortable about this. So we're reflecting back so that the, that our um, the person that we're dialoguing with knows that they are heard. Uh, we're checking for our understanding of what they've said, and hopefully we're going to deepen the dialogue as that gives them a, a chance to um, continue to talk. So what sort of settings is this used in? Um, it's used in uh, a, a really wide variety of settings. Um, like I said, I'm going to focus more on higher education, but um, in terms of uh, where people are practicing dialogues, it's both in domestic and international settings. So I think that a lot of the literature, um, uh, the, the research literature on dialogue will look at, um, for example, dialogues between Palestinian and Israeli youth. Um, there, there are folks that are now starting to do um, research on dialogues online. Um, so this article that I'm citing here uh, reviews a platform uh, that I believe is called like wedialogue.net. Um, I think that uh, given the pandemic, we'll probably see a lot more research on online uh, intergroup dialogues. Uh, I think that a lot of us had to make that shift very abruptly last spring. Um, and so I think that'll be helpful to have more research on what that looks like in best practices. Um, people are doing intergroup dialogue in high schools. Um, so this that study, the Wayne et al, uh, they did a study looking at dialogues between African American and Jewish high school students in Washington, DC. Um, and then in higher education, and specifically, I think much or most of the work that's done in the United States in higher education uses the University of Michigan's critical dialogic model of intergroup dialogue. So, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about that model, and, and I'm going to start with some of the theoretical foundations of it. So I would say that um, there's kind of two broad areas that are the theoretical foundations for this model of intergroup dialogue, that being um, social psychological theory and critical multicultural and social justice education. So um, in terms of social psychology, intergroup dialogue um, is based in part on the contact hypothesis by uh, Gordon Alport, which says that under certain conditions, um, intergroup contact can help reduce prejudice. Um, and so in some ways, intergroup dialogue, the model that I'm going to tell you about, tries to meet his conditions uh, to set up optimal intergroup contact. Um, it's also based in part on social identity theory and dual identity models and, and mutual differentiation or, or these other soci, uh, social psychological theories that say that, um, you know, we have we have social identities. Um, the dual identity theory model says that we can have multiple identities that we hold at the same time. So we can develop um, a superordinate group um, uh, identity, but also maintain the importance of our own individual social identities. Um, so social psychological theory undergirds uh, much of this work, uh, but also so does uh, critical multicultural education. So um, 
for example, uh, uh, Paulo Freire wrote uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and he talks a lot about um, dialogic pedagogy um, as a way to um, do social justice education. Um, and specifically, um, I think that the, his, his work is really influential in terms of not only how I think about dialogue, but about how I think about education more broadly. Um, and what I think is important and different about dialogic pedagogy as opposed to maybe other forms of multicultural education is that it really values the knowledge and experience that um, that the students themselves are bringing into the room. So dialogue is is an opportunity for us to value that knowledge and experience and versus having one person who's kind of like an all knowing um, teacher in the front of the room who kind of deposits knowledge into students. The dialogue values the students, uh, the, the knowledge that all the students or participants bring into the room. I think increasingly, um, we're also seeing the influence of intersectionality on intergroup dialogue. Um, I think a lot of the dialogues that have been um, typically facilitated uh, at universities across the country have focused on a single axis or like um, a dialogue on race and racism or a dialogue on gender and sexism. I think that we're increasingly seeing uh, people do intersectional dialogues. Uh, we had some intersectional dialogues here on campus at the University of Tennessee uh, in the past year, uh, one that was on race, class, and gender. Uh, we also did one that was on sexual orientation and religion. So I think that we're going to uh, see the influence of intersectionality um, increasingly so. So I've mentioned the University of Michigan's program on intergroup relations um, and their model of intergroup dialogue, which is a four stage uh, model of intergroup dialogue. And I'm going to share with you the stages, uh, I think, on the next slide. Um, their model developed in the late 1980s in response to racial tensions on their campus. And since that time, um, they've really kind of exported their model to campuses and universities across the country. Um, if you have an intergroup dialogue, program on your campus or where you went to school, uh, there's a good chance that they used this model uh, from Michigan. Uh, I've, I've put their website up there. They have a, a lot of resources and actually offer a really valuable um, workshop in the summer in Michigan, um, well, when it's uh, possible to travel to Michigan, um, that, that really gives a lot of, uh, of the background and the uh, bones of, of the intergroup dialogue. So, but ultimately what intergroup dialogue does, this model was developed in higher education for higher education. And it brings together students from social identity groups that have typically had a history of tension or conflict between them. So for example, I've mentioned a dialogue on race. We might bring together students who identify as people of color and students who identify as white. Um, or we might have sexual minorities and heterosexual people or women and men um, or people of different social classes or uh, people of different races, classes and gender. And these dialogue groups typically tend to meet uh, over an extended period of time. So um, the dialogues that, that we do here are half a semester long. And so we meet once a week for two hours a week. And um, where we're at now is that we're offering them as one credit classes um, in the second session. Um, and I think that a lot of universities do this. The University of Maryland had a similar model where students would sign up for a one credit dialogue class. I will say that I'm talking a lot about the structure of dialogues as classes. Um, in part, that, that goes back to Gordon Alport's um, conditions for optimal intergroup contact, where there's some support of, of an authority. Um, and so having these as classes gives us kind of that support. Um, but I will also say that the things that I'm talking about don't necessarily have to be put into this model of, of dialogue. When I teach a, a dialogue class, or I, when I teach a class that's not a dialogue class, I still talk about some of these things in dialogue as a methodology um, to kind of set the tone and, and um, for what, what I, I hope that our class can be like. I think that dialogue as a form of communication can be useful even outside of these classes. Um, so I just want to include that in there. So the four stage model of intergroup dialogue involves uh, the first stage of coming together and forming relationships. Um, so this is where we spend a lot of time developing group agreements or norms uh, or rules that we wanna follow or guidelines. Um, but we also spend a lot of time talking about what dialogue is. So in the first few sessions in this stage, um, I, I will sometimes do things like have them do role plays um, where I divide them into even smaller groups within, within the dialogue group and assign them either debate, discussion, or dialogue and have them come up with a role play of that and then do it for the other students. So they can kind of see like, this is what uh, a debate looks like versus a dialogue versus a discussion. Um, so really doing some of that meta communication about how we want to be and, and spending time forming relationships. 
The second stage, then we dialogue about commonalities and differences, um, including um, experiences with privilege and oppression. So um, you'll see down at the bottom here, I say that we have a shift over time from lower risk to higher risk. The privilege and oppression probably would come towards the end of stage two as they develop some relationships with one another because it's it is a bit higher risk. Uh, and then the third stage, we dialogue about hot topics. So the other shift that happens over time is from a focus on individuals to a focus on um, institutions and systems. So hot topics might be something like um, in, a, in a dialogue on uh, sexual orientation, um, gay marriage or same-sex marriage, things like that. Um, kind of these these social issues that that we're um, that we're experiencing in our world. Um, in a dialogue on race and racism, it might be about um, Black Lives Matter. It might be about immigration. Those might be the hot topics, but you can see that those are those are coming at a different level than the individual uh, point of view that we initially take. And then finally, the last stage is alliance building and action planning. So hopefully we, we see over time, these students have come together, they've built relationships with one another, they care about each other, they've done some exploration of their own identities, they've thought about how they fit into these systems and these social issues, and then what, if anything, do they want to do about these, these social issues that we're seeing? So sometimes we have them do collaborative um, social action plans, sometimes it's more individual. Uh, the University of Maryland used to have students come together from across different dialogue groups um, and have kind of like a, a conference or a convention where they would share their social action plans. Um, but you'll note that I say, what, if anything, do you want to do? So the goal, again, is not necessarily to come to an agreement, and it's also not necessarily to figure out, like, we're going to solve racism by doing this one thing. Um, it's more come, developing some understanding and thinking about um, what are some of the pieces that, that people can do to be anti-racist. So, so that's a bit about kind of the practice of dialogue and the theory behind it. Now I'm going to share with you a little bit about, um, about some of the research that's been done on intergroup dialogue uh, and a little bit about some of the research that I've specifically done. Um, and if, if anyone has any questions at any point, feel free to raise your hand. I always feel it's a little odd to me to be um, doing monologues when I'm talking about dialogues. <laughs> uh -huh. I'm, I'm always very conscious of that. But um, So in terms of, of research, uh, I'm going to talk about research in, in a couple of different ways, both research on outcomes and then research on process. And um, there's there's a large, and at this point, a large and growing body of research on intergroup dialogue that supports positive outcomes. So what I'm citing here, the Garnett All, it's a, it's a book from 2013. The University of Michigan had a multi-university study of intergroup dialogue um, that, that ultimately led to a book called um, I think it's called Bridging Differences, but it's about uh, about intergroup dialogue and about their research at all of these different universities. And some of the things that they found in an experimental design, so they had students that were um, randomly assigned to dialogue groups and then um, other students that were in control groups, and they found participating in dialogue led to affective positivity, so things like positive emotions and positive interactions with others, um, cognitive involvement, um, so liking things like complex or critical or analytic thinking, um, consideration of multiple perspectives, a structural understanding of intergroup inequality, um, intergroup empathy, and intergroup collaboration and action. So, so those are just some of the positive outcomes that they have found. Um, and now I'm going to share with you a little bit more about some of the specific research that I've done. And in order to do that, I want to give you a little bit of background about what our dialogues look like here. So I mentioned at the beginning that uh, it's been kind of a process to get our intergroup dialogue program started. Back in 2010, when I first came to Tennessee, um, I started offering intergroup dialogues as a required component of many, not most, but many of my sections of multicultural psychology for undergraduate students. Uh, I, I say it wasn't all of them because uh, I'm only able to do that when I have people to actually serve as facilitators. And um, in our program in counseling psychology at the University of Tennessee, we, we do have a social justice focus. We have a scientist practitioner advocate, advocate training model. And so one of the courses that our, our graduate students, our doctoral students are required to take is actually an intergroup dialogue facilitation class. Uh, it's, it's advanced group methods is what we call it. But when I offer the intergroup dialogues, it's usually when I have students enrolled in that class and they will facilitate dialogues for the students in the multicultural psychology class. So that's, that's where a lot of the data that I'm going to share with you comes from. Um, starting last year, we, we did add standalone uh, 
one credit dialogue courses. Uh, I've been able to get some support from our Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Engagement to support this program. And I'm working with a woman who's in uh, communication studies, actually. And she and I are, are trying to start a program on intergroup, uh, intergroup dialogue and conflict resolution, because she, she does a lot of work on conflict resolution. So we're going in, in, in the direction that I've, I've kind of uh, been aiming for, where we have these standalone dialogue courses. The other thing that we've added is um, a series of classes that will train undergraduate students to be peer facilitators of dialogues. So it'll be a two, two course sequence where in the fall they'll learn about the theory, research and practice of dialogue and they'll do some experiential um, like kind of mock facilitations with one another. And then in the spring, they'll facilitate dialogues for other undergraduate students. So we're, we're really trying to build our capacities here. Um, a little bit of background about the University of Tennessee that, that you may or may not know. Um, in terms of diversity work here, um, things have, have kind of come in waves and have happened maybe slower than they have on other campuses. It wasn't until I, I would, I think probably about 2014 when we had an Office of Diversity and Engagement created, and by 2016 the state legislature defunded it. Um, it is now back, but um, th that kind of gives you a sense of um, where we're at as a campus and around diversity and social justice issues. There are a lot of, a lot of folks that do really important social justice work here. Um, and I think that it, it speaks to, uh, I think the, uh, I, I think that some of the value of, of having more dialogues on campus here um, around these issues. So um, let's see, I'm not, it's not advancing. Okay, so this is this is the one study I'm going to talk about that is not um, something that I collected data for here. This is Dennis Kivigan and Julie Arsenault, um, but I'm gonna, I'm talking about this because I'm I'm then going to share with you something that I did to with some of my students to expand on this. But one of the things that they looked at was critical incidents in uh, intergroup dialogue. So they had participants uh, at the in dialogues at the University of Maryland right after each session um, about what was the most important thing that happened in their intergroup dialogue uh, sessions and why was it important to them. And ultimately what they found is that um, a lot of their critical incidents, they found three kind of major clusters of critical incidents. Those that are um, about affective or emotional um, aspects of the dialogue, others that are about cognitive or more thinking um, parts of intergroup dialogue, and then um, those that are about consciousness raising. And I think that what's interesting in the context of our conversation in Division 49 is that they point out that the critical incidents um, uh, related to affective and emotional and cognitive and thinking uh, fact, uh, parts of the dialogue are actually kind of similar to emotional and cognitive therapeutic factors. Um, and so I think that we see some overlap. Where they, where they found the difference was in uh, these critical incidents related to consciousness raising. And particularly what that refers to is things like developing an awareness of privilege and oppression and um, kind of a critical understanding of social issues. So expanding on this work, um, some of my students and I uh, looked at critical incidents from facilitators' perspectives. So that's what um, is important about dialogue to uh, the participants themselves. And we actually, from the facilitator's perspective, only found overlap in really one of our clusters with, with the Kivigan and Arsenault study, and that was affective or emotional processes. So similar to them, we found that um, emotional openness uh, was something that was important to facilitators, uh, a critical thing that, that was happening in sessions, but also things related to interpersonal dynamics. So things like being vulnerable, uh, learning from others, conflict. So, so I think that you, um, you can see as someone who's a group facilitator, you're really noticing these interpersonal dynamics and, and thinking like being vulnerable is what's really, really important in this group or learning from others or managing and, and working through conflict. The other cluster that we found was things related to facilitation tasks. And so, of course, this wouldn't come up with students, but a lot of the facilitators talked about things like managing anxiety, both their own and the participants, um, attending to the group development and attending to their co-facilitator relationship. So, for example, one participant said, um, after everyone sat in silence, my co-facilitator looked at me. So I went ahead and started in on how I remember a group member's comment at, uh, at the end of the last session and wanted to hear more from him about what kept him from speaking up. He went on to explain how he did not want to offend anyone and he was also struggling with the difference between debate and dialogue and how to say his opinion without crossing lines between the two. This led to a discussion with the group and the majority of the group contributed, contributed stating they feared the same thing. So, um, so really working with the group to um, 
uncover some of the things that are maybe not said and, um, and bring those into the room. We've also done some research looking at uh, group processes. So I think that a lot of the research that, that I mentioned earlier is about outcomes of intergroup dialogue. In terms of group processes, one of the things that we've looked at most is group climate. And we actually, when we study this, we use the group climate questionnaire that's often used in group psychotherapy research that has um, scales for engagement, avoidance, and conflict. And what we kind of consistently find in research when we look at group climate using this measure is increases in perceptions of engagement over time. So group members um, like and care about the group. They think what's happening is important and that increases over time um, and decreases in avoidance. We don't tend to see um, any significant changes in conflict, which I think, um, you know, like group psychotherapy, conflict is a part of, of a dialogue. And if, if we don't have conflict in a dialogue, I think that we're not dialoguing very deeply. Um, we, we've done some research, actually, and I didn't put a slide in here about this, uh, that shows differences in perceptions of group climate based on whether you're a member of the marginalized group or the, um, the dominant or privileged group. And what we actually see is um, the, the increases in engagement seem to be driven um, in large part by the folks that are from the marginalized groups. So over time, they, they feel even more engaged. Um, and I, I think that I interpret that as being um, that we, we don't often have a lot of time um, in higher education to have meaningful dialogues about these issues across social identity groups. And so I think that, that they, they get something positive out of it. Also in terms of group climate, we found that um, it relates to some of the outcomes that we see. So particularly in some of the research that we've done here at UT, we've looked at um, some kind of common uh, multicultural education sort of outcomes. So we looked at things like openness to diversity or universality, um, diversity orientation, and we didn't find, we, we don't find significant changes in those things. Where we do find changes in the, is in the outcomes that are a little bit more critical. Um, so things like um, colorblind racial ideologies. And specifically what we see is that um, from pre to post dialogue, um, participants decrease in their, uh, quote, blindness to racial privilege and institutional discrimination, which I think is, a, is, is an important outcome that, that hits at the critical multicultural education piece. But we also see uh, increases in empathic perspective taking, which I think is another um, uh, really positive outcome. And uh, what's in pertinent to group facilitators is that it's group members' perceptions of engagement and the slope of increase in the perceptions of engagement over time um, really helps to um, drive those positive changes that we see. We've also looked at things like um, affect over time in sessions. So um, looking at positive and negative affect over time, uh, we see that at the beginning of dialogue groups, and, and these, these two figures that I'm showing you here, um, sessions are centered so that actually zero is the, the middle session uh, on these. But we see at the beginning of the dialogue, uh, positive affect is pretty high, negative affect is pretty low. Um, as we continue on through the dialogue sessions, we see positive affect start to go down uh, and negative affect uh, start to go a little bit up. And I think that if we think back to the four stage model, that's when things are getting a little bit more risky. Uh, we're having conversations about privilege and oppression towards the middle of, of the um, dialogue time sessions. And so, so it makes sense to me that we might see these sorts of patterns. What I think is interesting though, is that if we take that into consideration along with their ratings of, set, of the sessions in terms of session depth and smoothness. So again, this is um, a measure that's used in group psychotherapy. We see that their ratings of the depth of sessions is going up. So even though their positive affects going down, their negative affects going up a little bit, they think the sessions are getting deeper um, and they're getting less smooth. And so I think that if we take all of these different pieces of the process together, um, we're seeing people are getting more engaged, their positive, uh, at the same time, their positive emotions are going down, their ratings of the depth are going up. And so I think it kind of reinforces the idea that these are difficult dialogues to be having. Um, but even through the difficulty um, and the decreased smoothness and the increased negative emotion, uh, participants get something out of it. They're becoming more engaged and they think that it's important. I wanted to note that there's um, 
that there are other connections to um, intergroup dialogue that um, people are starting to make and some that have been made um, quite a while ago, uh, particularly related to group psychotherapy. So David Bohm, the person that I mentioned that's done some writing on dialogue, um, said back in, in the 90s that dialogue is not therapy. And I think that a lot of a lot of people in higher education, particularly those who aren't therapists, like really try to reinforce this, especially because it's often offered as a graded class. So you don't want to say this is a, this is a graded class and it's therapy. What he suggests we call it is sociotherapy that rather than having a goal of trying to like cure any one individual, um, we're trying to bring about societal level change. So he called it sociotherapy. Um, the other, another person that I wanted to acknowledge or, or a set of folks that I wanted to acknowledge in terms of thinking about the connections between dialogue and counseling um, is our very own Eric Chen, who, um, who I think is one of the first people to write about dialogue in group counseling um, back in 2003. Um, he and his co-authors had, had a chapter that talked about how the form of communication of dialogue can be useful in group counseling because every group that we facilitate is multicultural in nature. Um, there's also some folks who have written about how counseling can uh, inform intergroup dialogue. So Lydia Curry, uh, back in 2004, wrote about working with emotion in intergroup dialogue. Uh, as you can imagine, um, when we have these dialogues, uh, things do get personal and they get emotional. And um, it takes some skill to be able to work competently with emotion to not avoid it. Um, and so from a counseling perspective, that those skills that we have can inform intergroup dialogue. More recently, some folks have, have suggested that maybe, maybe intergroup dialogue is a form of counseling. So Moss et al. wrote about, um, uh, wrote a call to, for more research on the connection between intergroup dialogue and counseling. And they said, one of the things that we specifically should look at is whether the therapeutic factors that um, operate in group psychotherapy also operate in intergroup dialogue? Or what would, would the kind of quote therapeutic factors be in intergroup dialogue? Where is there overlap and where is there not? They suggested, for example, that it can be cathartic for folks to, um, uh, to dialogue with people across difference and about some of these difficult issues. There's cohesion that, that takes place in these sorts of groups. Um, also, in terms of group work, uh, intergroup dialogue can be useful in um, group training, so for doctoral students. And I mentioned that my students uh, all participate in a dialogue facilitation class. And um, so I wanted to share with you a little bit about what that looks like for them. So Brittany White is uh, one of my former students, and this was actually her master's thesis a few years back. Uh, and what we did was a qualitative study of the our students who are doctoral trainees in counseling psychology who take this dialogue class um, as part of their training. Um, and what they report is that this sort of training facilitated both their development as group leaders and as social justice advocates. And so I'm going to share with you some of the quotes that they said. So um, in terms of supporting their development of, uh, of knowledge of group processes, uh, one participant said, learning that conflicts are necessary, that, that conflicts necessary uh, and expect part of social justice um, and figuring out how to respond to that and how to be okay and respectful while also hard something that has to happen if you're going to do really good social justice work so learning that conflict is a part of uh, social justice work and it's also part of, of the groups that we facilitate um, another participant said we try to mirror like a sharing of power, especially in the race group. So it, apart from us just talking about it, we try to have equal time or more time in terms of talking, of uh, taking turns uh, of what we, uh, we were very intentional about how we structured the group and um, so that we would both be seen as facilitators and not just one. So, um, so they, they spent some time thinking about the power dynamics, and this relates again to what we know about groups as social microcosms. So we have a social microcosm of a group and the facilitators are learning that, um, that part of that is our social identities playing out and sharing power in the group and modeling that. Um, in terms of supporting, uh, intergroup dialogue supporting their development as social justice advocates, uh, one student said, uh, I felt like before I knew this was what I wanted to do, but I felt like I have the tools now. I've seen this thing work, and so I can bring intergroup dialogue to the world. So I felt very empowered. I felt like I had learned enough skills and also not 
learned enough skills, but uh, realized I didn't have to know everything in order to make a difference or make a change. And so in terms of my advocacy has severely uh, impacted that for sure. So a further development of critical consciousness and ally development is one of the things that we see in, in psychology students who take uh, facilitation classes. So ultimately, um, the conclusion here is that um, I think that group psychologists have a lot to offer, group psychologists and group psychotherapists, to the research and practice of intergroup dialogue. Uh, and hopefully the, my discussion of the theory and, and research related to that illustrates that. But I also think that intergroup dialogue and dialogue as a form of communication can have a lot to offer uh, group psychology and group psychotherapy. So I will um, stop there and I'm happy to um, take some questions or engage in some dialogue with, with folks. Joe, uh, any questions for Joe? And I would assume that Joe will be willing to share with us the slide uh, later on. Yeah, and I would have uh, the recording uploaded through the Green Footy Night channel. Yes, um, I had a question. Yeah. And in a lot of social activists or community spheres, there is this concept of calling in versus calling out. And I'm wondering how this sort of intergroup dialogue, if it does account for calling in versus calling out or what this would look like in this situation. I, yeah, I think that that's a, a great question. And I think that, you know, what, I, what I've seen over time as um, I, I see, um, pockets of more socially engaged students, um, students often will will bring that up as what they want to do. So typically in in our first session, what I'll often do is bring in like a big notepad and have, have them talk about ground rules or agreements that we want to have. And it, it seems that we're at a point where almost inevitably something like that comes up. Um, and I think that um, you know, our discussion of how we're going, how we want to be with one another in terms of talking, um, I think helps to facilitate that, that if we're like, this is what dialogue is, we don't have to agree or disagree, or we don't have to agree with each other. Um, and so if, if we have that sort of mindset, um, you know, we can, we can call people in. I do think that, um, you know, that doesn't mean that if someone says something, for example, explicitly racist in a race dialogue, that we wouldn't say, you know, that's really hurtful, or here's why that's, um, that's hard to hear, or here's how that impacted me. So it's not giving people free reign to say whatever they want. But, um, but I think that part of the reason that we do dialogue over a number of weeks, um, for us, it's eight weeks, um, some universities do it over an entire semester, so 16 weeks or so, uh, part of that is so we can develop some relationships with one another um, in order to be able to do that, to call people in uh, when it's necessary. I think that, um, you know, on campus last last year, we had a day of dialogue that was put on by our Office of Multicultural Student Life. And one of the things that um, they asked me and uh, my partner actually to talk about was um, cancel culture. And so I think that dialogue work um, is kind of antithetical to to calling out and canceling people that like we want to keep people engaged um so yeah i don't know if i answered answered your question um so much as uh just shared a lot of different thoughts but i think that that's important and it does come up i really appreciate your review of that literature and the story of how you got there <clears throat> which makes plain and clear how useful this is right here and now i'm thinking about what we're doing at florida state i need to go scurry around a little bit. I mean, it's very compelling and I can see as you explain it, how potent this can be. Great, thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, I was trained as a counseling psychologist and um, I don't know where, where everybody on the call's training is in what, what domain of, of group psychology or group psychotherapy is, but I think that, um, you know, if you're a group psychologist or a group psychotherapist, you have certain things that I think you can bring to this work. And mm -hmm. um, I would love to see more people involved in this work um, that, that take that sort of group perspective. Um, because it, I mean, it's small, it's a small group intervention. And I think that there's, there are a lot of similarities and some differences to group psychotherapy and um, to, you know, the intergroup contact research in social psychology. So I think that there's, there's so many connections that we don't really make um, to, to groups and this sort of work. So for a lot of folks who are uh, group therapists, some of those elements of the intergroup dialogue might actually uh, come up in their own uh, weekly uh, discussions. So I wonder, Joe, uh, at what point in time do you think that the group should not continue 
uh, engage in intergroup dialogue when that doesn't seem to be productive. Because in unlike um, the, the, the model you showed with us earlier, in those structured in the personal group, they probably did not plan to talk about those issues, but they may just come up in the one sessions. So at what point in time, if I were the facilitator, how do I determine this is not going to, to be constructive in the end? So I need to find a way to, to either stop it or to maybe before it escalates to the next level. So that's where I don't know how to find the, the, the line. Yeah, you know, I think that I think that that's a great question. Um, and, you, you know, I, I think that my answer is kind of more so my speculation, because I think that, um, you know, in, in a group when multicultural issues come up, um, and particularly things that could be difficult to dialogue about, um, yeah, maybe some people didn't expect that to happen, but I also wouldn't want to shut down the person who has been maybe victimized or, um, so I think that I like setting the tone that th that we're going to dialogue about these issues when they come up because they are I mean they're really important parts of people's experiences as humans and so like to just like leave that at the door um, because there's other um, non identity related topics that come up I think that that kind of short changes um, short changes them and I probably misses a lot of the um, of what might be related to the presenting concern, I don't. I'll have to look and see if there's any research on that. One of the one of the things that um, that Jill Paquin and I are, are uh, hopefully uh, going to have uh, completed soon is a, is a review of, of multicultural group research, and I'm, I'm curious what uh, yeah. what maybe the literature says on that. Like, what are the boundaries between like following down a path related to social identity versus not? I, I think the other thing that I would say, Eric, as I'm, as I'm talking about this is that I, I don't imagine that there's other topics where we would say like, oh, that we're certainly not going to go there. So I think it's interesting that like, I, I mean, I have the same perception that there would be people in a group that could say, look, I didn't come here to talk about racism. I didn't come here to talk about your experiences like with sexism in the workplace. Um, how is this relevant to me? But um, it becomes like, I think that for that reason, it becomes um, potentially so powerful. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I know the answer to your question. I, I like it though. I think it's a good question. I thought perhaps maybe instead of talking about the issue itself, maybe talk about maybe the, uh, the process. So for example, this uh, resistance, uh, those uh, resentments, why do we need to talk about this? So those underlying issues, perhaps those process issues, may be important for us. Just like you described earlier in terms of the safety in the, the group and what the norms here. And so that actually that'd be helpful for us to talk about as well. But anyway, it's just a fascinating uh, presentation that you have to share today. So um, I think it's 12.53 now in New York. So maybe uh, is there any more, uh, does anyone have any more questions? Maybe one more question before we have to stop. Take one, two, three. Okay, then on that note, I thank you all for joining us. And then I thank Joe for doing such a wonderful job to, in providing an overview, oh, just like uh, what Josh mentioned yes, earlier. Josh. This was going to, it's going to uh, offer a lot of the topics implications for the group service. It would also offer a lot of training implications for the uh, counselor, uh, group therapist, educators, and uh, in addition, for the group therapy researchers, I think this would also be helpful to action as well. So thank you, Joe, and thank you everyone for joining us. Yes, thank you. And I, I'm, always, uh, I'm always interested in collaboration. So if anybody's interested in, in having further conversations about this, let me know. Wow. Bye. Good to see you, Josh. Thank you, Joe. Good to meet you, Tangela. Bye, Eric. Good to meet you, Tangela.